The long string of riders here, and Bourbon has been on the front for the last couple of minutes or so, trying to break the elastic. And Chris then, the reigning Olympic pursuit champion, on the front here at the moment. A lot of discussion going on whether he might ride the pursuit in place of Graham Aubrey, who got beaten by Colin Elliott in one of the World Cup races recently. Uh, but Chris, I think, uh, with him soldiering on, as he's doing, he's determined to get to Paris, might find it difficult to get the sharp edge on his speed to defend his Olympic crown. But don't forget, on Eurosport, we will be bringing you every day the cycling. You'll get cycling on the box. Uh, so we'll be there to bring you the best of the action. And I'm looking forward to seeing whether it's Graham Aubrey or uh, Chris Borman in pursuit. Uh, so one or the other, I don't mind. But certainly, let's see if we can retain that, uh, that, rainbow, that, uh, that jersey that... Um, of the rainbow rings that went to uh, Chris Borman in Barcelona. Green jersey down there, Isabel. They're all a bit twitchy, aren't they? They're all over the place. This is where it's dangerous, by the way. So we get a touch of wheels. There's Neil Stevens, flowing locks. He's riding this year for Australian Olympics, and he must be about 33 or thereabouts, 70 33. Amazing number of quite older riders who are taking part in the Olympics. And uh, I said a few days ago that. The article I read in one of the national newspapers about how many of the other athletes are in their 30s, and they didn't mention a cyclist. I hope that somebody catched up with the fact that many of these giants of the road we're going to see here have ridden the Olympics in the past. And even Olaf Ludwig, who won in, sale, uh, in Seoul, by the way, he's going to ride the Olympics, and he's taking that young man, Zabella, who we saw in the green jersey a moment ago. He's going to shepherd him here, and if he goes down to a sprint and the Olympic Games at Atlanta on that rolling course, which some people think it will, some people think it won't, then I'm sure the experience, the skill of the sole Olympic champion uh, will certainly help as Ludwig makes sure that the lad who's here riding the green Joe Isabel is in the best place if they all come down the finishing straight in a fair old uh, lump. So there we are, back on the Tour de France here on this stage then, 13. 13 are lucky for some, but lucky for some. Uh, I don't know if it's announced today or being announced today, but certainly Phil Liggett, by the way, the Cyclist Touring Club have asked him to stand for president. I think, in fact, he will have no opposition, and we'd like to see uh, our good friend from Channel 4, Phil Liggett, as a president of the Cyclist Touring Club. I'll put that out again later on, because I think it has a lot of significance, because Phil, as you know, is very much into the road racing game. He's been on about 22 Tour de France's now. He's ex-first category roadman, and a great cyclist still... Uh, putting in lots of miles. In fact, he's going to ride the Land's End John O'Groats in September sometime this year with his wife Pat and some other friends. And uh, so I'd like to send my congratulations to Phil over there and to the CDC members for being astute enough to put a man like Phil on, on the top of the, of the Cyclist Touring Club. And I think somehow that might lead to more things. I don't want to get into politics at the moment, but uh, I think while the CTC stands for a Cyclist Touring Club, uh, I think we could probably... Uh, perhaps change the slogan and say that it's catering for today's cyclists because the CDC seems a much wider based organisation now and perhaps we might find them uh, even more helping the use of bicycles and perhaps now looking at the racing side as well with, with Phil at the helm. You never know what might happen, says he. <laughs> Stirring up a storm back in England. Oh dear. Well, better watch out when I go to Manchester for the World Track Championship, what I say. There we are then, all the lads together on the road here. When I say lads, the bike ride 145 and left in the race uh, now over the halfway point in this Tour de France and still the top men prepared to sit in there watch each other and you see here that nobody really has got a cohesive idea how the hell to get away it's a it's a rolling ty uh, type of course early on so even though if we're going to nip off to the, uh, the the Formula One in the qualifying session hello that's nice isn't it they're going truck racing for a minute. That's a great sport on Eurosport as well. So after jumping around here, I've got a suspicion by the time we come back after the, uh, the motor racing that we will find maybe a group that's got away. Alternatively, them all sat together for that final thrash towards the end. So people at home, I don't know what the weather's like back in Great Britain now, but if you can find time not to mow the lawn, trim the hedges, or nip down the supermarket, or better of all done it this morning, then stay with us for cycling to two o'clock and also stay throughout the, the Grand Prix too because I think it's, it's nice to see how Damon Hill is, is going so well and I, by the way talk about motor racing these lads today are actually riding as you can see without the crash hats on they're not deciding on this stage here that it's going to be fast like it was in Holland and necessary to put those uh, upturned pose on their heads those plastic things that make it difficult for anybody to see who the hell's uh, riding their bike 
And they did make the, the comments, and perhaps it may happen one day, I know Claudio Chiapucci decorates his helmet, that perhaps he might have some of these riders, when they put the hard shell helmet on, uh, doing their own bit of decoration so that the, the commentators can spot who the heck it is they're talking about. It's very difficult with uh, nearly 200 starters to pick out um, uh, riders when they put those crash hats on, but certainly uh, Graham Hill, when he was uh, riding his, uh, driving his car, he had the rowing club, London Rowing Club, uh, uh, white, uh, I suppose called spears, or white uprights on his hat, and his, his son, Damon, had the same sort of crash hat, and certainly when you see uh, the two cars going round, you can, you can tell which is, apart from the number on the car, of course, you can pick out uh, which is Damon and which is uh, Gilles Villeneuve by the crash hats they wear, so perhaps psychics may take a note of that sometime, but today, no problems, they've got the hats off, and we can pick it out much better. Well, this is our first sprint today, which could almost have qualified, I suppose, for a third category climb at uh, Allegri. 23 and a half kilometres have been covered. And the bunch don't seem to be too unduly worried at the moment. Or are they? On the sprint classification, it certainly will go here to the Festina rider, who's rolling up quite comfortably indeed. Now, after you get a bit of a jump around like this, sometimes the uh, the riders decide to go for a break. I'm just watching them now and waiting for confirmation on the old cans about the are these three going to pry themselves away Roslato well they have had not much success so far ever present TVM yet again and the commissaire decided to shove our motorcycle out of the way just as we're trying to pick up who the heck it is down there there's a helicopter roaring away for its top shots what happened yesterday and the day before you get a little split opening up and somebody doesn't want to chase it down and once you get a nice mix of teams on the front the rest uh, shut it off and I can see here we've got uh, MG we've got uh, Onse out there we've got Roslotto in that little group we've got Festina away at the front and the gap there at the back you see that one midway through the through the field so many riders now want to get themselves a stage victory they, they know they've only got um, the stage today, uh, tomorrow and on the 15th, uh, before we then climb up to uh, the top of the Lord Hodgecombe climb on uh, stage 16. And then, of course, we've got the big day. Here we are, uh, Pascal Ev. Ev, Amberger and Ferigato. Well, Ferigato has been bouncing around for a long time now, trying to get away, a little breakaway group. Let's see if he'll be successful this time. The stage 13 from Le Puy en Valais to Superbesse uh, Sancy, setting off then from this delightful uh, town there. You can see the outcrop of the volcano and that lovely church on the top, the medieval chapel of Saint Michel d'Aguil. Perch way up there, right above the town, and on the way through to the finish today, there could be quite a lot of action. We haven't had a chance to look back at the other lovely uh, part of this world here where the uh, Again, on top of Volcano, we have the green-eyed virgin and child made of the old cannons melted down from the Crimean War, but uh, it's been a lovely place, and uh, we thought in the last two days we'd have some action, but we have today. We're looking at a chasing group here, including Claudio Kipucci, Fernandez Jeans there, number 33, Brochard's in this little group, and uh, 
The attacks have come thick and fast ever since we, we uh, started the stage today. And various times, the yellow jersey, Indrain and Romiga being marooned, Alana's been away, so we certainly got, I think, today the first real attempt to make the yellow jersey suffer and struggle on this stage. We're now, having gone over the top of the, uh, the Col uh, de Fauché, we've now got, uh, what, something 85 kilometres have been covered so far. We've got round about to 95 or so. Uh, kilometers to go 94 95 to the end and there are 24 seconds back to this group you can see the main pack are not far behind that's Claudio Chiapucci on the right hand side uh, he jumped across to this chasing group it's been like that pretty well all day little groups forming at the front never getting more than about uh, half a minute on the ever watchful main pack here and you can see the telecom pink jersey in the front there having to do quite a lot to keep their eye on the uh, on the, the people, A, who are looking for a stage victory, and B, those who are close packed round uh, uh, Reese on general classification to take advantage of some of the little stepping stones that are forming down the road to try and jump across and make an advantage of the groups that are forming at the front. Uh, leaders will go back to them shortly, and I'll identify them when we get to them. There, Fernandez Jean's going through. Rushard. And again, you see these teams that we've got at the moment on the attack here are ones that we haven't seen much of so far belly an extremely good demanding climber best young rider in the kellogg's pro tour was that about three four years ago now claudio kipucci well he's taken a right old pacing in the race so far he has to do something sometime and this is the leading group at the moment as soon as we do that we go back to chasers roslotto determined to try and get some result from the tour so far they've been putting men on the attack time after time. They haven't got their stage victory yet that they've been searching for. One man we haven't seen much of so far has been Fondrius, their team leader, who seems to be still sat in the pack and uh, perhaps still suffering from his uh, operation, not getting the mouth back in that he wanted to put into his legs. So he's been pretty quiet. Their best placed man, the riders from the Roslotto team, that's the Russian State Lottery. I can see this chap coming through now at the moment. He's Ugramov, who lies 11th overall in general classification, 5 minutes 27 seconds down. So he's keeping his powder dry for the stage when we go up to uh, Lord Hotacom and then over the top of the Pyrenees because that's when he can make up a lot of time on the rest of the riders. That, of course, is yet to come. That's the gap that you can see yourself back at home. Some of the groups we've had so far forming have been too big, actually. They've been something like about 10, 12 riders, even up to 15 at a time. And whilst they've contained some pretty useful characters, they haven't been able to weld together a concerted effort to, to stay away. And so the, the bunch has come back to them, having taken their time to come back in here. Brushard, ever active. It seems to me to be Festina's day. They've had uh, Pascal Erve away. They've had uh, Dufo go away. They've got uh, this man here now having a go again. They keep firing riders off left, right and centre. And the same has been happening with the TVM team. And we just there uh, could see Bo Hamburger going away on this, the next close climb of the day. We've been over the top of the Col de Fourche. This is the, the Col de Tutte. And that's, you see how close together those two climb down. Look at the right-hand side of your screen, right over there, oops, gone. Um, there were three red splashes on your, on your screen. Those are the final climbs of the day, because today the course has a couple of sprints, one very early on, we had after 23 and a half kilometres have been covered at uh, Allegre there. Uh, Pascal Erb took that one ahead of Hamburger, who you see in this little group as well, and Fedigato, so they've already been very active right from the, from the word go. Her first, Hamburger second, uh, Fedigato third at the sprint after 23 and a half uh, uh, kilometres had been covered. And then after the uh, Col de Fourche, 82 kilometres just down the road because we just come through the 89 kilometre point, the Col de Fourche, that was Katai uh, who took that one ahead of Bartoli and Thibault was in third spot. They had a gap of something like about 12 seconds back to another group and then the main pack about 24 seconds behind. So as fast as you blink an eye, the whole thing uh, forms and reforms again. And it's, it's turning out to be a very interesting day. And certainly to keep uh, close to these little 
stepping stones down the road. It's, been, it's meant that Indrain's Bonesto team and the Telecom team for Reese have had to do quite a bit of work to make sure that uh, nobody of consequence gets away. Somehow I think the lid may go on the race once we drop off this climb because it, it rolls along uh, just an undulating part of the world until we get to the uh, Cote de Santana. There, that's confirmation, I told you. Uh, no, Catay, Thibaut and Bartali has just slightly altered the one they had before. The one of the Col de Fouche was Catay, Bartoli and Thibaut, and they changed places. Thibaut going ahead of Bartoli on the Col de Tutte. Thibaut is the telecom rider, sorry, is the, is the uh, Motorola rider in the red, white and blue colours in the centre. Catay here for the Roslotto team and Bartoli for MG is in this one. So these are our leading riders now. We keep sipping backwards and forwards to the, uh, the groups, but now we've got ourselves well entrenched with the leading threesome. I said a form from the various groups we've had going all the way through the, uh, the race today. Bartoli was in this group. He watched Eurosports coverage, the Tour of Flanders. You'll remember that uh, he took that one. Bartoli ahead of Baldato, Jan Mazzeo in third spot. In fact, Museo had been trying early on today to uh, make a break because they could do with a, a stage victory, could the uh, Mapai team. And there goes our shot of the dead dragonflies. They are, in fact, of course, our helicopters. I say helicopter without the H because the French can't pronounce the H. I haven't heard them say helicopter, but uh, helicopters down there. Now then, this is the main pack. And yet another one rocketing off. Mappa again. Well, they haven't had that stage victory today. That was up to date. And they've got to do something on this one, I think, even though they're looking after Romigo. If you haven't caught up with the news, Romigo's got a, a rather painful right knee. They've been working on it. He's still got the plaster on his knee. And uh, there are 30 seconds is the gap at the moment. That's our leading group here. And back to the chasers, which include last time we saw them, uh, Claudio Kiopucci and Fernando Jeans and the ever-present Pestina Rada's in the shape that time of uh, Brochard, but this is our leading group at the moment. Just a little message, by the way, about 40 seconds back to Peloton, so they must have been absorbed. They're just putting the Peloton up here, so the, the group containing Claudio Chiapucci didn't look like there was a, enough fire in it to, to stay away, so they've been absorbed, and one or two more are going uh, hammering off uh, along the way. We're now, let's see, uh, we've got some, let's see, we've just done 90, oh, yeah, about 90 kilometres actually we've covered so far, and oh my little note, 127 kilometres when they've covered that, so we've got about another 37 kilometres down the road. Um, just a little interesting thing for the, the, the landlord of the Queen's Head at Vox, we're going across that single track railway that goes down from Clermont Ferrand right the way down to Berzier near the Mediterranean. Uh, the, the lean de, de, de Colses, and uh, it's called after limestone plateau it traverses and it goes alongside the, uh, alongside the river. And we may, I hope, have a good shot of that one. I don't think we're going to pick up, it's a bit further down, the, uh, the Garabit Tvada built by uh, uh, Gustav Eiffel in uh, 1882 and 1884. So that's ahead of us on the race now. Lots of interesting little villages are going through over some interesting parts of the world before they head into the finish, which is one of those ski resorts up at uh, Subaru Sensei. And while some of the riders we're looking at now are just going for overall victory in the stage, still it might mean today the yellow jersey could be under a lot of pressure. The main group of riders that are just keeping the leaders, I suppose, within a reasonable sight, but it's making the telecom again stretch their legs just to make sure the gap doesn't get too much. Although we have seen some of the riders like yesterday get 15 minutes on the main pack when Telecom decided to take it easy. And there's been some uh, complaint, in fact, that the, uh, the Telecom have had an easy ride and some of the other teams that are looking to put their men in top position want to put more pressure on them. That 25 seconds then are uh, the leaders ahead of this of the main group. These are our two leaders at the moment, Bartoli and uh, Thibaut. Bartoli went up of the Tour of Flanders early on this year together with his Motorola compatriot in the breakaway here, Thibaut. Again, they're doing exactly like I said earlier on, looking for a stage victory. This, in fact, was the territory where Max Chiandri said he was looking uh, to get for a stage victory, but of course he's out of the race, if you haven't caught up with it, with some problems with his knee. And uh, Armstrong climbed off very early in the race, but three or four days into the race. I can just check exactly when he climbed off for you. But uh, certainly 
he was looking to get some stage victories here when I had a chat to him, but then he felt sick and decided to knock it on the head and, uh, and went back to America to train for the Olympics at Atlanta, which we will be covering on Eurosport. Every day of cycling, you'll get it on Eurosport as well. And we're looking forward to that and to see some of these uh, pro riders, which we've got in the, in the big field today in the Tour de France, uh, actually contesting the, uh, the road championship at Atlanta. Of course, people like Cipollini have also retired from the race. We're out there training, so I don't know whether it's good to stay with the race and fly over to Atlanta and try and get so informed for the Olympics or whether one should be uh, climbing off your bike. Certainly, Chris Borman, as we're looking at him here in the centre of your picture there, number 91, has said he's determined to finish, and I've said it before and I'll say it again over the coming few days that I hope a lot of you Brits back there will look quickly for a deal with your local travel agent. There's your gap on the screen. Uh, you can, by staying overnight on a Saturday night in Paris, get some very, very good rates on the ferries if you bring your car across, or in fact you want to come by the Eurotunnel or a flyover as well. The sooner you book, like now, the better it is. And uh, I hope Chris gets through there, but get your bookings if I were you, because even if he doesn't, and I think he will, but even if he doesn't, then at least you can have a good weekend in Paris and see the, the finish of the Tour, which this year, by the way, the, the finish... Uh, the last stage is shorter and much closer uh, to Paris. The, the final stage uh, from uh, Palazzo into, um, into Champs-Élysées. Palazzo is actually on the, uh, on the edge of, uh, of Paris, and you can easily get out there uh, by, by, by Metro or by Aria, whichever the case may be, to, to Palazzo, and you could go out and, and see the start and mingle with the atmosphere that, that is there, that's on the Sunday, jump on the metro and hammer back into Paris and see them there. At least I'm saying so, I'm just looking at the time. They start, in fact, on the... Uh, we're looking at our two leaders at the moment, the 21st stage, Palaiso to Paris. It starts at um, 10 to 2 in the afternoon and they get back into Paris on the first of the circuits at round about um, uh, 10 to 4, that's right. So you've got a couple of hours uh, to get back, and I, I'm certain you could do that on the uh, on, on the metro, no trouble at all, or the RDR, as the case may be, or the SNCF. Certainly there will be a train line that will get you out and back again. I should check that with your travel agent, and, and, or can you go by car or something, but certainly one way to do it in this day and age is to go by some other form of transport, train, uh, plane or boat, as the case may be, and get yourself over to Paris. Very nice city, if you've not been there before, why not go there and celebrate another Brit finishing the Tour de France? There it is, Chris Borman, keeping our fingers crossed that he makes it all the way through to the finish. Very gutsy man, I mean, when you consider he started life as a time trialist, riding 25 and 50 mile time trials, in fact, he rode on the track when he got a, 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 a bike, which I suppose you would call was out of the skip as such, and he used to ride on the track at Kirby, where Doug Daly was the, the manager of that track, and uh, his father, Chris's father was a cyclist as well, and he didn't really push him into it, just that Chris liked the sport. And uh, here we go through the feeding station with a, a Brit in here who's making very good progress indeed from being a, a tester, as we call him, in Great Britain, setting off at the early hours of the morning at minute intervals, and from being a national champion at 25 and 50 miles, then going on to be a world cast pursuit to taking the Olympic Games uh, pursuit. And so Chris now in this race. And you watch him go through here, it's Saturday afternoon, you people watching Eurosport, because during the week you may not have seen what we've been up to. This is the feeding station where they grab their, what we call, oppie bags. Uh, we call them oppie bags, or well, some of us do call them oppie bags, because Sir Hubert Opperman, uh, who raced over in uh, uh, France and Europe for many years before he came back to Great Britain and, and broke such thing as a Land's End John uh, record, uh, Sir Hubert Opperman was first to bring back many of the things, like little hats that, that they wore on the continent and the, and the bags, and we used to call them oppie hats and oppie bags, and even he had a derailleur gear early on, we call that the oppie gear as well, um, when he was uh, at the forefront of, of new ideas and, and brought them back to, to Great Britain when he was racing there. And unfortunately, Sir Hubert Hoffman uh, died about um, a month or six weeks ago. He was, what, he was 91 or so, and I suppose he went the way that many cyclists would like to go. His wife had stopped him, banned him from riding his bike, mind you, at, at something like 90, because she was afraid he might fall off and hurt himself. And so he got an exercise bike uh, to, to still ride his bike. He rode the exercise bike, and he used to watch uh, television um, recordings of, of races like you're watching now on his exercise bike. This is like 91 or so. And one, yet one day he got off his exercise bike and collapsed and died of a heart attack at 91. I thought, what a nice way to go. He's a great character. I had the good uh, fortune to meet up with him. Uh, what do you mean, about uh, 10, 12 years ago now, when he came across 
to Great Britain and we gathered together all Land Gen Johnny Groats record holders that were still living. <laughs> we had a, had a nice do at the pedal club in, in Great Britain. It was good to meet up uh, with Sir Hubert and uh, we wish his wife well out there in Australia. But he was a great character, he was a tremendous rider. Survived the Tour de France off he did, by the way, when they had national teams. And he was riding with about three other Australians, or four, about four or five of them, where in those days, the national teams would have up to ten men, or even I think ten or twelve men. I have to check my facts on this, but they had big teams, and certain of the stages would run off as team time trials. Now, you can imagine, when he'd only got about four or five riders with him, and he was up against... Uh, uh, he's up against uh, big teams. They were losing lots of time, and the the uh, and obviously he'd have to sort of ride on his own. And the French really took to up his guts and his character. And he went on to to win enormous races like the the Paris Brest Paris. Now that's about a thousand miles or thereabouts, I think, or 900 miles. Uh, from you, you know on the map where Brest is and, and where Paris is. Well, he, there was a race from Paris to Brest and back again, and, and Sir Hubert got that one. So I'm rabbiting on whilst the a feed for the main pelotons going on here. Steak and chips for me, can have the uh, steak saignon. 15 seconds back to that chasing group, 2.45. I think if they're sensible, yeah, they're, they're just having a chat here. I think they just roll on now and wait to sit in the group that's coming up from behind. No sense in batting yourself into the ground, that feeding station they've just gone through. So look, it was... Um, that's 68 kilometres from the finish of the race run through because this group now a lead of nearly three minutes on the main field probably like to settle down a bit and we'll uh, start to ID most of them I've got a little note of pretty well everybody's in this little group at the moment is that Jonker is the man on the front at the moment born in Holland went over to live in uh, Australia with his parents and came back to Holland and now riding for a Spanish team and that's Abdul Jaffaroff on the left hand side there with, he with the big thighs an enormous sprint and there Chris Borman right behind him well Chris can roll too as well um, uh, Solensen's in this group, that was the Rabobank uh, white and orange uh, jersey they went to, that's Tempucci followed by the flowing locks of uh, Rochard and the two men have been away, Bartoli and uh, Thibaut are sent to be sitting at the back of the moment. This is a good group with a lead of nearly three minutes on the main field. <laughs> Front of the race and unfortunately then that uh, in that breakaway group that Katai had the misfortune to puncture, that was 142 we just saw, Yonker here on the front. Guarini coming through. And then Thibaut having done so much work to try and stay away until Katai got that punch and they were down to two men. Abdul Jafarov, very familiar figure. Like his hairstyle seems slightly different to me this year. That's why in the sprint though they didn't quite place him. I don't know what he's done to his hair, but it looked a bit different. Amazing character. There, Chris Boardman. Looking good and rolling hard. And we just saw Brochard and Pestina going through. And this is the main group. They must be just approaching, I suppose. Uh, Sozilange. We're just going through it. We heard all that noise from the cowbells. So long on the little river of the Omer. And there the telecoms on the front. Well, these riders aren't in this tour to see what's going on around about and they're desperate to get the stage victory and they're that breakaway group looking good Chris Boardman coming through Israel, this is it now I wonder if we're going to see I didn't look too carefully then this, this, this railway line Go down from Clermont Ferrand to Versier. They only have one train a day, just potters down to the Massive Central. 200 miles of rather delightful scenery. No, 
nice shot. 15,560 people live here, if you want to know. Give or take a few. And this is where, when they get to as well, where the martyr Sant Ostermoin, who preached Christianity in the third century, came from. And we're looking at the chasing group here. There's the yellow jersey. Gone. He's looking absolutely comfortable and relaxed. He had a puncture before we came on air, and it was so calm. He just got off his bike. He changed the wheel. Just got back on the bike, rode up towards the back end of the race vehicles. Two or three of his teammates dropped back to him, and he just soldered on into the back of the pack, just like he was going out on a, on a club run for the day. And then they moved their way through to the front and took up the position you see here now, the pink train of Telecom. Christian Hen, the national champion, going through on their little Pinarello bicycles. Very famous name in cycling circles, Pinarello. Making also the bikes that have been ridden by uh, Miguel Hinduen. Home going through. In fact, uh, Pinarello turned to making bicycles. He was a racing cyclist himself, and um, in his first three seasons, he won 17 races and finished third in the national championship in 1942. That's the man who makes these bikes here with, with his family anyway, but he used to uh, make bikes in his uncle's shop. And um, it was in 1925 that um, they first started out making frames there with the Pinarello name on them. Well, Pinarello went to making bicycles because uh, in 1951, two of Italy, there was, there's Dalia, the river, and there is the railway line in the background I spoke to you about. The, uh, the railway line, in fact, the, some of the bridges, a uh, couple of them were made by uh, Gustav Eiffel, who designed and uh, had built the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Tony Ronger, looking there, his right knee. Still very sore. I'm not surprised that he hasn't uh, put the hammer down today. Mapo tried to get men away in the leading break when we had the start of the race today. Lots of uh, breaks formed and then caught and then went away again. And Mapo trying to fire right off down the road because I think they could do with the stage victory at the moment. Uh -huh. What's Abdu doing? Oh. Goodbye. <laughs> He's off. Well, the next sprint is at 30 kilometers to go at Sorier. He's not quite there. Well, Abdul Jafarov is known for his, his sprinting ability to come out of the pack and just go rocketing past people. And those you saw at the start of our program a couple of weeks ago remember that uh, he went an awful crash. And I've said many times in the past, and if you just switched on for the first time to Eurosport, let me remind you that, in fact, he, he, when, he, when he got back up after the crash, when his crash had absolutely shattered, although no bones are broken, no troubles with his... Uh, body at all he was he was unconscious and then he opened his eyes he asked which race he was in well there he goes now through uh, and it must have been about a couple of years ago he won a race for the lone break on like 10 kilometers into the finish and the uh, when the press asked him after what did he do that for when he's such a good sprinter he said well everyone accuses me of sitting in the pack and never trying to um, to do anything on my own he said so i just showed him today that abdu jafarov can win stages by going out on his own well he's an awful long way to the finish right now abdu and uh, I can't quite comprehend his tenacity now to go away. And he's not careful there. 45 kilometres, that's what, 27 and a half miles or so. And he's got that group, group behind him. There must be some reason in it. I was talking about these Pirinello bikes that the uh, telecom team are riding upon. And in fact, um, Pinarello well himself finishing last in 1951, the black jersey on the on the Tour of Italy. And in 1952, his formation, the Bottaccia team he's riding for, uh, offered him 100,000 lira not to ride the Giro. <laughs> they couldn't put up with him being last. 
So he was paid not to race that year, and Alfredo Binder was also paid not to race, and Andrew Jaffos were on his own, because the Italians had got fed up with Binder winning the race. He dominated so long in the past, so Pinarello took his earnings and went and opened a frame shop in Treviso. Andrew Jaffroff, 22 seconds down the road. This is a remarkable performance for him. I don't quite know what he's doing it. Of, of course, there again, there are what, 14 riders here. They're rolling quite well, but if that telecom train catches them and they all sit up, and Abdu persists with this one, I mean, it's a hell of a long way to go, about 25 miles to finish as far as he's concerned, and it goes up a bit towards the end, too, which is where I, th I think that uh, the attacks might come thick and fast if the, the whole thing does come together. Uh, Abdu will have some, I would say, difficulty climbing because he has climbed over the big man before. He's had the green jersey in the Tour de France and carried that through to the finish in Paris. Of course, that was the year he spectacularly, in the sprint, decided of his own accord to demolish the barriers down the finishing straight, and that picture's been shown time and time again on television. But with Abdu, he can't sprint in a straight line. He doesn't deliberately cut into people, it's just the, the way he rides his bike, he goes a bit crabwise in towards the finishing line. Nobody knows it and tries to give out the way. That time, of course, there was nobody on his right-hand side as he started sprinting, but the barriers. 30 seconds for Abdu. There we are. What a great sight. I know he's got lots and lots of supporters, this man. So I know we're all at home trying to urge him on. Now, those are the sprinter's thighs. Look at that. And you see also, again, a long body, uh, shortish legs, shortish arms, that crunched-up position, sitting across the top of the bike. That's a typical sprinter's position. the string, they go back in line again. Nobody's leaving any gaps at the moment. You may remember when uh, little Chepi Gonzalez won his stage, that um, in that leading group, oh, 48 seconds, Abdu was still persisting. When Chepi was at the, at the back, what happened is that as a man, you see Sorensen up, as I'm telling you, Sorensen went towards the back. Uh, what Chepi was doing was leaving a little gap, so the man who came off the front would then have to go in front of little Chepi, and they, they didn't know him at all, Chepi Gonzalez. And uh, so... A couple of days ago, he got the stage victory, so they, they just dropped in front of him and took him along for a ride, because he only did a little fellow, 1 metre 67 tall, and the lightest and smallest man in the race. And as a Colombian, they didn't expect him to do any good in the sprint, because he nipped off and got them. And if you didn't hear the story I put out the other day, in fact, he'd heard the uh, team managers of the uh, uh, MG team and another team that had got one of the riders in the break coming up and describing the finish and telling them what to do, and so he knew exactly what they were going to do. And so he listened to this, and off he rocketed uh, and got the stage victory, which gave him 50,000 French francs for his trouble, and Abdul Jaffroff searching for that. You see, he's way down on everything at the moment. Abdul would have been in, I think, with a shout for the green jersey, but for that uh, terrible crash that took him out. Well, back to Chepis Gonzalez, by the way. He's got uh, five sisters, uh, a, a wife, a mother, and a baby daughter, so he's, he's got a lot of uh, females around about him, and he actually went to... Um, uh, work at nine years of age, did Chepi, because the, uh, the family couldn't afford to keep him at school any longer, and then he had to borrow a bike or even save money to hire a bike to became enough money to, to, to get one. Well, another man who had a hard upbringing then, Abdul Jafarov, uh, riding with the Russian amateur team for many years, and finally they were allowed the, the Russian amateurs to turn professional, and Abdul, a bit late in life, turned pro and then showed his very great sprinting prowesses comes from Azerbaijan. And again, I said uh, just a moment ago, see his long body, his head well forward over the uh, handlebars, those short arms, short legs, big thighs. That's a sprinter for you, but he's rolling hard now. And this is the part, of the course, where it's fairly flat. The next climb is going to be at uh, Côte de Saint Anastasie, and Anastasie, and that comes after 161 kilometres. Nice shot. Here we go. In fact, I don't see he's got a computer there. Abdu normally, as he, oh, as he has, as I say, normally Abdu just hangs on to the finish and then tries to beat him on the sprint. He's off on his own here. Come on, let's keep our fingers crossed for him. See the scars on his elbow here from his crash? Fortunately, he didn't do too much damage. Well, it's now five minutes the gap back from uh, Abdu Japarov and the main peloton. Here he is. Oh. 
Scott. He's no threat to anybody on General Classification, Green Jersey or King of Mountains. But I think the, the group that's sandwiched between Abdul Jafarov and his main field here might have other ideas, might reel him in towards the, uh, the end of the race. Certainly getting a lot of encouragement on his way through. At San Flore, 36 kilometres left to go. There's a sprint down the road, by the way, in uh, one other four kilometres to go at uh, Sorrier. This is probably going to be the biggest sprint victory he's had in his life. If they don't chase him down, he's going to be about thick end of a minute ahead of the second place man. Come on, Abdu. Keep at it. This is a very determined effort. I think that's the Eglise uh, de Chastel up there. La Cruz Paval, this is the river that we're going to be running alongside for quite a while now. All the way along here since we left uh, Iswa on the railway track. We're going through the, the gorge as well of the, the, the Corbould George Gorge before they turn right at uh, let's check on the map here we turn at Bel Belbilex, that's right. We're gonna turn right there and head up in towards uh, Santa Jose and Abdul Jafroff now 58 minutes. Sorry, 58 seconds. <laughs> 10 <laughs> seconds is his lead. So he probably stopped. Thibaut, the moment roller, Sorensen, number 88. Borman just moved through on the right hand side of your screen. Again, we're staying with Yonker at the moment. Interesting character, quite a tall fellow. About 26, 27 years of age. Actually, his father was a keen cyclist, and his uncle, Ron Yonker, was an Australian road champion in the late 60s and represented his country in the 68 Olympics as such. So quite a family of cyclists. And the Abdul Jaffer, 5.25 back to the peloton. Oh, this is good news for Abdul. I say he ran about as far as he's about 32, uh, 33 kilometres to go to the finish. And they don't seem to be too bothered at the moment. We did think today that there might be some attempt on that final climb uh, to rattle the yellow jersey. That might still happen because uh, we've not seen any attempt by um, the people who were placed closest to the yellow jersey, Bjorn Rees, to do anything to go with any of those, those groups that have been on the attack ever since we started the stage today. This being stage 13, unlucky for some. And lucky for some people, I mentioned earlier in the programme, but if you're listening to one of our recorded versions or just come in and switched on the, on the telly, uh, that uh, Phil Liggett... Uh, has uh, been either elected or is about to be elected the president of the Cyclist Touring Club. And uh, congratulations go to Phil, the commentator for Channel 4. And uh, it's interesting then to think the CTC, which has been traditionally Cyclist Touring Club, now, as I say, caters for today's cyclists. I've uh, altered their initials to say caters for today's cyclists. Have had an ex racing man like Phil Liggett, who was a first cat rider, rode on the continent, and then for uh, now 22 years, I suppose, been on the Tour de France, the journalist for the Daily Telegraph and uh, as a commentator for the Channel 4. Uh, Phil then, congratulations then on your presidency, sir. South Florida, 140 kilometres from the start this morning. Mentioned to that glorious church. Now, then, also today, um, I say hello to Joan Dixon, by the way, up there in Bolton. I met her son Mike today. Mike and I worked together in screen sport uh, some years ago, and evidently Joan switches on to listen to, to cycling on Eurosport. And I know that all over the country we get lots and lots of uh, people who don't know much about cycling, like the sights and sounds of the countryside, and to see the riders here wending their way across some beautiful countryside. And I hope I can tell you a bit about where they are, what they're doing, and convey a bit of the atmosphere of this great, uh, great country. Christian Hen on the front of the, of the train, and I mentioned earlier on the train 
that railway line which is on threat of being shot when they came through uh, as well. The French Parliament are debating that the uh, SNCF, who own the railways, it's still nationalised over here, but they're losing so much money that that railway line, which only has one train a day and has never made any money, but they say it's such a lovely part of the world that it goes down, all the way down from uh, clermont Fran to uh, the Mediterranean Sea, should be kept open, and I hope they can find ways of keeping it open. Many of the stations have already closed, by the way, but perhaps they might keep it open because more and more tourists are going back to using the train now, and uh, if it may not be catering for the locals who've now got their cars and so on, perhaps the tourists will start uh, using the trains again, and we can have people off the roads and more space for cyclists, says he. Andrew Jafferoff looking to get a stage victory. We only finished once in the past at um, Superbest Sancy, uh, and he's now got 1 minute 20 seconds lead. This is tremendous. It is Wellens that won the stage here way back in 1978, and that was the year that um, the overall victory in the race went to Bernardino, Zotemuk second, and Agostino in third spot. And that was the year that Eddie Merckx stopped his career with some 500 professional victories to his career. Well, the camera moved then away from Abdul Jafarov, quite right, I think, to pick up the chaser, being the split. And Abdul's going to take the, the sprint there, in inverted commas, with 30 kilometres to go at Sorier. It's going to be the easiest sprint he's ever got, I suppose, in his life. And now, looks to me as if, uh, ah, two very experienced riders are after him. That's Sorensen and Bartoli. If these two start riding hard, then the chaser have got to do something about it. I hope keep my fingers crossed that Chris Boardman, who's in that the group there, will try and get across to them and put in some of the uh, turns he can do as an extremely good uh, uh, time trialist. But he's got to get there, and these two are very strong indeed. Bartoli and Sorensen, looking back to see if they've got themselves a sufficient gap. And it doesn't look like they're going to do it, though, as the Roslato rather toes them. There's the man in from the Bonesto team who's just going for the ride, Rodriguez, being tailed up as well. Borman's crossing the gap. Good on you, Chris. Get in there. Watch those two. And Abdul Jafarov way down the road now, taking first spot in that uh, sprint. And look at the gap on the left-hand side of your screen from Abdu back to this, this group here. So just over a minute as such. Each sprint that they have, there's, what, a couple of them today, there's 5,000 French francs for first spot, 3,000 for second, and uh, 2,000 francs for third spot. And the you can roughly divide by, well, it used to be 10 in the old days. Uh, it's now getting to about 8, I think, um, the, the francs to the pound. So Abdul Jafarov would have earned himself, I suppose, the, the thick end of 600 quid for his, his, his riding off the front. He's more interested in the victory of the day. Stage victor getting uh, 50,000 French francs for the first spot. And, of course, the glory of the stage victim there. Chris Borman looking good at the front, keeping an eye on things. He's got Claudio Chiapucci behind him. I suppose, really, that Chris, in his wildest days, when he was starting out as a... Or his wildest dream, sorry, when he was starting out as a time trial, he's never thought, there we are, that he'll be riding here in the wheels of Claudio Chiapucci. Alongside people like Rolf Sorensen. Stay victory in the Tour de France of the past, because Claudio Chiapucci, king of the mountains, the little fellow there, the blue shorts. I don't know if uh, Chris's family are watching on television back there in Hoylake, but there goes Dad. So that's a message for Edward, uh, Harriet, George and baby Oscar. Dad's busy at work. And the Tour de France is his office today. There he is, number 91. Howdy are looking back to see wherever he's got to. Of course, Chris went on not only to get the Olympic gold medal at Barcelona, but to take the, the hour record. And it was in the Tour de France a couple of years ago when first Aubrey uh, smashed the hour record and frightened everybody, and then Chris Borman set off to break the hour record, and the continental team managers opened their eyes. Uh, Aubrey got signed for the group mom, but it didn't stay there very long, and the team folded anyway, so that wasn't a bad thing. But Chris, snapped up by the GAN team, has really had quite a lot to do with the improvement in the GAN's uh, overall understanding. There, Chris is starting to go on the right hand side. This is good to see. Borman's on his way now to try and close down Abdul Jafarov. Anybody going with him? 
Oh, there's the flag. Hey! I nearly stood and saluted the Queen then, as up came the Union Jack. Come on, lads, we've got something to cheer for now. Only one Brit left the race. It's Max Chandry hurt his knee, and it's Bourbon on his way to try and get the Jaffer off. Chris Borman has the time trialing ability to catch up with Abdul Jaffarov on this stage 13, 177 kilometres from Le Puy, en uh, to Superbesse. Borman now going away, and the rest realise they've got a race on their hands there as uh, Yonker second in line behind one of the Roslotto riders. Looks a bit like Katai has been trying. He tried the other day to get a stage victory. He's away in the breakaway group, and now he's got big Yonker behind him. Well, Yonker and perhaps and Chris Borman. Both of them speaking English, well, of a sort, because Jonker, although he was born in, uh, in Holland and holds Dutch nationality, he, in fact, um, went down to Australia and lived there, went at the age of two and came back to Holland when he was nine. And now he's, he's peeled off the front, left Cate come through, Bartel is going, then then there's Taffy. Well, there's, there's two big rollers for you, Bartoli, winner of the Tour of Flanders on the front at the moment, Bartoli. Uh, looking back over shoulder, see Taffy third in the Peru Bay this year. Big, strong men, these chaps can really roll hard. Chris Borman's got a race on his hands now, and Abdul Jafarov way down the road, about a minute ahead of them. Might well be snaffled up yet. We're going to start on the little climbs here. This is Kugul. 27 kilometres from the finish for Abdul Jafarov. The climbing is going to really start in about another, what, 10 kilometres. Shoo, shoo. Cows coming here down to the side of the road, keep out of the way, whatever you do. I don't seem to be too concerned. Bartoli rolling through. And Taffy on his wheel. 55 seconds back to Chris Borman. Nice to see his name up on the screen on this then. The Sage. 177 kilometres. Let me put you in the picture what happened early on. 23 and a half kilometres at uh, Allegri, Hervé, uh, Hamburger and Ferigato were first, second and third in the sprint at that time. They've been part of a group of riders, and you see now the main field nearly six minutes back on Abdul Jafarov. They begin to roll, the Vanessa, they come forward to the front. They want to try and keep this, I think, fairly compact to see if Indrain can uh, jump away up those final climbs there. So we've got a race within a race. We're going to see whether Abdul Jafarov or Chris Borman, all those men up there, some six minutes ahead of this group, can win the stage. And what's going to happen, I think, pretty certainly, that we're going to see some of the top men in this uh, main field jumping around to try and outdistance the yellow jersey. So we've got uh, two for the price of one today. Sit back there, put your feet up, we're at home and watch it. Stop mowing the lawns. We've got about another, what, 45 minutes of racing, I suppose. So a good excuse to get yourself a cup of tea or open the six packs and watch the race now unfold as it runs in and to all you in various public houses uh, perhaps I think the old Queen's Head in box or the, uh, the checkers I have to mention those in Bailey's down the road because I know the boss will be interested in the train stories but everybody else there, wherever you are all over Great Britain then I hope we'll see Chris Borman looking for a top spot today and these Bonestos don't snaffle him up but still six minutes in this final three quarters of an hour I think it's a bit too much for them to pull back that leading group but we still don't know as to whether Borman can stay away from the other riders who've been away now. Let's look down my notes as we see them and swinging off the road into the narrow... This is very narrow lanes here. It goes up and down quite a bit, and it's uh, going to aid the little group down the road. Just having a look at exactly where they went. They're 94 kilometres cat-eye punctured, that's right. Um, and Bartoli and Thibaut have been away for some time. 12 riders were coming up to them at that particular point. So, around about 100 kilometres, the group that's down the road in front of this lot uh, got itself properly formed. So they'll have done something like about uh, nearly 80 kilometres, the leaders, if they stay away from the main field. It's about 50 miles out there. And I think somehow this group you're watching now have lost any opportunity of getting first place but the pressure's on. By riding at this sort of speed now, you see, and the Vanessos are on the front, they're doing it deliberately, I think, to uh, start hurting the legs. The telecom team had done a lot of work earlier on, and if they go up the front now, and here we see Abdul Jafarov with, what, 25 kilometres to go? Get me a watch out. We should be getting time checks coming up, but if we don't, what we're looking for, of course, is a gap between Abdul and Chris Borman. Hey, what a, what a thing that'll be. If Chris gets up to... Uh, 
up to Abdul Jaffer after looking back there, Chris Borman, I can't see him in that one. Chris Borman has left this group here that he, he was with them. And he's trying to get up to Abdul Jafarov. Sometimes the cameras don't pick up one man on his own. We had a circumstance like this the other day when one man was wedged between the leaders and the chasing group. So down there, climbing up the road. You see how nicely the tarmac is. By the way, they remake the road quite a lot when the Tour de France comes along. You see all the new bits of tarmac, the black tarmac there. They come out, they check the road. So the gap then, 38 seconds it is now, according to my watch, between uh, Abu Jafarov and that group. So it looks like it's coming down. And where's Chris Borman then? I think I pressed my watch a bit late, so let's say it's about uh, 45 seconds. And now the Bonesto train's coming up. The gap nearly six minutes at one time. Let's see what they've done by the time they get to 25 kilometer point. Let me put you in the picture. And if you've been listening to our program right the way through since we started uh, today, I hope I don't bore you by repeating the general classification, because you don't always get it in all your newspapers. So you see the scars here on the uh, left leg of one of the Bonesto riders. They battle their way, these riders now, to stage 13 of Tour de France. They've covered like, something like 1,400 uh, uh, miles since we left to start in Holland uh, two weeks ago. And the overall position is that uh, uh, Ries is in the lead as the yellow jersey, the man with the shortest time so far in the race. We're looking now at the Bonesto train at uh, Alonso on the front. And the reason they're doing this is that they're trying to put the pressure on the yellow jersey, Bjorn Rees, who leads by just 40 seconds from Avenger Berzin of the Gavis team. We might say the Gavis light blue jerseys come through and also try and make things tough for Bjorn Rees, who says he's the strongest man in the race. He's been boasting, he's been saying, I'm the strongest, my team's the strongest, and I'm going to take the jersey through to, uh, uh, through to Paris. Well, he's certainly ridden very strongly so far. Let's see what he does today. So Rees then... Uh, 40 seconds clear of Berzin in the blue jersey. Romiga's third overall general classification at uh, 53 seconds. And we look down there at the riders trying to pull back uh, Abdul Jafarov. Then uh, Olano from the MAPE team is 56 seconds and he's in fourth spot at the moment on general classification. Fifth overall, Jan Ulrich from Telecom won't attack Rees because he's the same team, one minute 38 seconds back. Uh, Luttenberger, who I saw hovering behind the Benesto train is uh, sixth at two minutes and 38 seconds. Richard Veronk, seventh at 3.39. And the man who all eyes are on this year, Indrain, is in eighth spot at four minutes and 38 seconds. And now let's concentrate upon the split that's happened in the group that went away after about 100 kilometres had been covered. Chris Borman looks like he's now got company. Jonker's gone up to him. It looks to me like Bartoli has also made, and Taffy. And these are probably the four of the strongest riders that were left of that breakaway group. Although Claudio Chiapucci looks like he's missed this one, and he's just uh, courageous enough to try and go back up there and perhaps tow the others as well. That's Bartoli on the front, then Borman, then Jonker, and then Taffe behind him. When I checked the time with, with 25 kilometers to go, it's only about 45 seconds back to Abdul Jafarov. I haven't had any information on... Uh, a link. I'll just uh, listen to see if we get some more information coming over. Uh, Taffy looking for a victory today for the MAPE team. Here he is, Abdul Jafarov still out there, but uh, not for long now. You see the cars going through, and the Uzbekistan is now about to be overtaken. And here they come then, Abdul Jafarov's the moment of glory, over and done with then. The maximum lead he had about a minute, and now we're going all the way back down the road to the, uh, the main group. The, the gap now is, uh, I think, at five minutes, um, it's coming down all the time. So the Bonesto team putting the pressure on the gap then, just under five minutes.
Benesto putting the pressure on this stage 13, 177 kilometres from Le Puy en Valais to Silvervesse. The gap then five minutes to Abdul Japarov, uh, who is at the moment leading on the road, but only about uh, 10 or 15 seconds away from the chasers. And those chasers, last time we saw it, was Boardman, uh, Bartoli, together with Taffy, and uh, who was the other one? Oh, Yonkers, that's right. So there are about four men trying to pull back Abdul Japarov. By the time our camera goes back up there, and I'm just listening on the radio to see if we're going to get any more information, they might well have uh, absorbed Abdul Japarov. Well, they got this lovely gorge here. Ah, oh, they're all stopping. Something's happened. I'll wait to see if I get information on that one. All the Benesso team pulled off. They say it's a puncture to Indorain. Yep, it is. Oh, la la la, as the French are all saying, hold down my headphones. Because Indrain was the one who was putting the pressure on. You see now how suddenly he's gone flat across the front. And Indrain had to pull back some of that time. He was 4 minutes 38 seconds down on General Classic 8. He had to start pulling back a half minute here, half minute there, each day, to get within about two and a half minutes of the yellow jersey for the time trial a week's time on Saturday, when the 60 kilometres uh, it was going to be the day when Indrain could take anywhere between two and four minutes out of a lot of the top riders. And that's what they were doing today. And now you see how the lid's gone on. They've all gone flat across here, because certainly a gentlemanly thing, they won't attack a man when he's a uh, punctured like that, so Indra is not being attacked at the moment, but conversely, the speed's gone out of this group here, and it'll be a moment respite then. So, the riders at the back will be coming up with Indra, and then action will be resumed. It'll certainly help this group here then, because we've got Abu Japarov at um, just 18 seconds ahead of uh, this group here that has split a couple of times trying to pull back the big bold Abdul. I think he had company before very long, but what a drama with Indrain puncturing. Well, they're all there at the moment, and Abdul Japrov, 20 kilometres to go. Let's see if the Benestos resume the chase. They've got to work their way all the way up through the group, uh, get Indrain up the front again, and then start to put the pressure on the yellow jersey. What a disappointment. Still, they haven't caught, they haven't got really onto the, the biggest climbs of the day yet because they just grind their way up towards the top of the Cote uh, Sainte Anastasie, a second category climb, and that will be when they go over the top 13 kilometres from the finish. kilometers from the finish you all saw the banner there and this is our little group they still haven't got to Abu Jafrov last time check we had was uh, 18 seconds back and here he is still on his own Abu Jafrov who took off before we got to the sprint at Soria after it was somewhat 40 kilometers to go so he's done about 20 kilometers out on his own about 12 13 miles or so Inside 20 kilometres for this strong specialist sprinter. This has got to go down in history as one of the most unusual performances from Abu Jafrov, and I wonder if he can get a stage victory on a lone ride like this. But he's only got 18 seconds. In fact, he's gone back to 30. That's interesting. They've broken their rhythm now. The victors we had so far in the Tour de France on the Prologue time trial two weeks ago. Uh, Zulla won that uh, one. Moncassin of the GAN team, the French rider, took stage one. Stage two, Cipollini from Italy, uh, from the Seiko team. Zabel from Telecom took stage three. Sogram from uh, the Obervie Peugeot team uh, took stage four. Bladevans, the Dutchman from the TVM team, took stage five. Burgart, the Dutchman from the Rabobank team, took stage six. Leblanc, the Frenchman from the Polti team, took uh, stage seven. Berzin. The Russian from the uh, Gavis team took stage eight. Bjorn Rees, the Danish rider, 
from the Telecom team took stage nine, and Zabel wrapped it up nicely for Telecom, taking his second stage victory on stage ten. And Chepi Gonzalez, a diminutive little um, uh, Colombian for the Kelme team, took stage eleven, and uh, Pascal Richard of MG took stage twelve. So quite a different uh, number of teams have had stage victories so far on this now the thirteenth uh, stage of the race on the thirteenth day. Who's going to be lucky? Valmelix, and this is the one where they really start to climb. They've been going up very steadily all the way, but now they're going to start the big climb because he just got from here six kilometres to the top of the climb. He's already done three kilometres of the climb, so the final six kilometres towards the top, and there are the chasers. It's a second category climb, and, and I don't think, uh, I can't remember the last time when uh, we saw Abdul Japrov go the top of uh, a climb in, uh, in first place like this. This particular course you're watching today, by the way, 6,000 uh, riders, cyclists, uh, rode this course. The Velo magazine ran a special race along this course about three weeks ago. It uh, seems at the moment that the yellow jersey has lost about three of his teammates uh, coming up on the radio, so the yellow jersey is there, but his teammates are dropping off like flies. Well, the... the Bonesto team have done the damage. A lot of the telecom riders are struggling now. The yellow jersey is still there, but uh, telecom had to ride today. They had to ride yesterday. They ride the day before to keep the, uh, uh, the the pace up. And what's happened now? It looks like some of the telecom are dropping off the back under pressure of Bonesto, who rescued Indrain after his puncture. They come straight through the field, and look at the way they're going up here now. This is what they're trying to break the elastic so that uh, uh, Indrain, who's four minutes and 38 seconds down on the yellow jersey, can really grab it back a bit of time as we go up now the second category climb of the uh, Côte de, de Sainte Anastasi uh, when they get to the top they'll be 13 kilometres from the finish but if you haven't seen or heard the comments so far when we go down the uh, climb it's not too far down at the bottom to a place called Bessé then we start again another climb uh, up the Côte de Faux just a th third category short sharp climb that one's going to be uh, just a couple of kilometres of climbing a little short descent and then up to the uh, that they have the final climb up the Monte de Superbesse again only two kilometres but two two sharp climbs in, con in uh, succession both two kilometres long and that can uh, mean a loss of maybe a half a minute to somebody as Abdul Jafrov now with four kilometres to go to the top is beginning to feel the pain and the, the tiredness in his legs after being on his own now uh, for probably something like about uh, 25 kilometres and any time now he might well be swallowed up by this group here still eight men strong Chris Borman sitting at the back alongside Yonker in the pink Taffy over to their left the Mappe rather looking back and that seems to me as if the Rather from Nozlotto wants to stretch his legs a bit to Salvadelli. He's followed and marked by Bartoli, who looks back to see where Sorensen's got to because Sorensen's another strong man. This is a tough little climb. Other long uh, climbs up the Alps, the long climbs up the uh, Pyrenees, and the riders can settle in and go at their own pace. But on these short, sharp climbs like this one, the gaps can open up. And I'm looking down there where the yellow jersey's got to. He's just at the bottom of your screen now at the moment, Bjorn Rees. And the Bonesto's pull off one by one at the front. They've been powering along here. And I think somehow we might see, it looks like Festina on the front now as well. They're certainly going to work hard to put uh, Veronkin with a position of getting more points in the King of the Mountains competition. There's just one pink and white jersey still there, like second back in line. And they turn and start the real rough part of the climb.
They really are motoring here. So Super Bessie only had one finish here in the past when Wellens, who was a very good climber, he took the King of the Mountains award in the uh, Tour de France. That particular year that uh, he got the stage here, Martinez won the King of the Mountains climb, and those who follow mountain biking may know there's a young lad called Martinez now who's doing very well in the mountain biking in the Grundig series, and he's also been a world cyclocross champion. Well, his father, Martinez, took the King of the Mountains prize in 1978 when we last time we came up to Silvesse, and the damage is being done here. They're going far too fast for Indra, I think, to come across. All the history of the tour. I've been reading through the intimate portrait of the Tour de France by Philippe Brunel, as I've been on the tour. That, uh, book from the Romney television people you can get it uh, I think if you look in cycling you see where you buy these things and it really is when you look back over the years how these giants have ridden over the big tops of the mountains the Alps and the Pyrenees but in recent years they've had these special ski resort to finishes that have made quite a change and the race has evolved over the years and right now the yellow jersey on the shoulders of Bjorn Rees is the Dane going to run out victor of the Tour de France. Well, we've got one week to find out. Telecom going back on the front again. Well, they had some riders struggling. There, Bjorn Rees just getting behind his teammate. There's one on the front. Both elbows well and truly strapped up from crashing. Got to look down there. For the numbers of the riders, the ladder is doing well for the telecom team. I say that they caught Tebow. Tebow's been dropped, so he's, been, he's now lost five minutes in about five or well, about, about, about five kilometres. Looking down there in the main pack, just seeing how many of the telecom riders are still left in there. Ulrich, number 28, is leading on the Young Riders competition. And he's there looking good at the moment. Udo Bolt's riding well. How are we going to see an attack? On the left-hand side, looks like LeBlanc is beginning to move forward. little yellow figure on the left-hand side, the Palti rider. LeBlanc has always been known on the mountains to suddenly rock it off. And Indrain poised on the right-hand side here to launch an attack. He th I think he really needs somebody like uh, Orlano, for instance, on the left-hand side, the world champion with a white uh, top to his, his uh, racing jersey. Overonk to go. Look, they're dropping off now, one by one, the pressure's on. Oh, I thought this would be the day when we might see some pressure being put on the yellow jersey. Unfortunately, we're losing the cameras uh, covering the, the main part of the race up in front, where Abdul Jafroff is still staying away from that uh, group that have been out there now for the thick end of 100 kilometres, and Bourbon's in that leading group at the moment. But, of course, a lot of interest back here to see if uh, Bjorn Rees can be put under pressure by any rider. LeBlanc starts to go, and Barak went with it. I could have written the script for you, and now can Indrain jump across to them? And LeBlanc launched himself off. Barak goes with him. Then Luttenberger goes as well. Now Rees has to come back. Rees has to come back at this one, particularly Luttenberger, jolly good climber indeed. Lying Zikto Raw, 2 minutes 38 seconds down on the yellow jersey. LeBlanc is no great threat. He's 7 minutes 8 seconds down on the yellow jersey. But Rees recognises that Luttenberger, a great mountain truck climber, Stage victor in the Tour of Switzerland just before the Tour of France started and went on to win the race overall. That's the fellow in the white jersey and the, uh, you see the bands coming down on the shoulders, dancing out the saddle, the fellow in the pale blue shorts. Luttenberger, the Austrian, third back in line now. And look, Reese has gone right on his wheel. He recognised that man is a danger to the overall position and also he can climb. Reese is now jammed against the far side and Indrain, has he got any power left in his legs to come away? on this climb. Abdu Jafroff has finally been caught. That is a disappointment to all the Abdu fans I know. Luttenberger looks back. Polka dot jersey wrong in the front. Then the Blancs drop back and Reese looks over his shoulder. Dufo is there. And so Burr's in the pale blue jersey, right alongside the rainbow jersey of Alano. 
Kelmy Scartin is climbing well, just, just in there with them too. After this second category climb, a short little drop, and then they start two more sharp little climbs, and it's an attack coming off now. There they go, Dufot is launching an attack on the climb here. Dufo looks back on this stage, Le Puy en Valais to Suvabessi, stage 13. Could be unlucky for the yellow jersey if any of the contenders of the crown can jump across to the little fragmented ridings that are in the groups ahead of them on the road. Nice little quick move here. So, what's going to happen then? Way back in the pack, who's going to respond to this one? Laurent Dufo, the Festina rider. Now going away, Dufo at the moment on general classification, 10th overall, five minutes and three seconds down. He certainly can't pull all that back on a, a stage like this today, but it means the yellow jersey is constantly under pressure as LeBlanc starts to go yet again. He's seven minutes and eight seconds down on general classification, in 12 spot, off he goes. Well, this climb here goes up uh, the thick end of 10 kilometers, over five miles of climbing. And now he's got Jufo. So, in fact, my mistake is 4.9 kilometres of climbing this one. That's right, 7.9%. And away they go. The yellow jersey has recognised the danger. He won't really chase uh, LeBlanc down, I don't think. He's just got to make sure that nobody else comes up to him. How strong is that man, uh, Reese? But uh, LeBlanc wants another stage victory, but first he's got to catch up with the leaders on the road. Ahead of him lies Boardman, Sorensen, Chiapucci, Yonkers, Salvadelli, Rodriguez and Brochard. As we're looking now at the remnants of the main pack. Reese looking strong. Looks very strong. And there goes Veronk. There's no love lost between Veronk and Leblanc. Of them all, Veronk is the greatest threat to the yellow jersey. Three minutes, 39 seconds down. But there again, I think in the time trial, Reese would say, well, I don't mind him getting closer to me, Bronk, because I can uh, knock out two or three minutes on that 60-kilometre time trial on Saturday week against a man like Bronk. Not a great time trial is Bronk, just a great mountain climber, what a character. So, Bronk on his way up, LeBlanc on his way up, and you see in the distance those slow-moving vehicles, there are more riders ahead of them, the remnants. And so LeBlanc here, looking down the road for those riders that escaped. Way back when we'd only covered about some 90 kilometres of the race. And bit by bit, they're pulling in the leaders. This is our leading man on the, mo on the road at the moment. Salvadelli, a young rider from the Roslotto team. And wedged in between Salvadelli and LeBlanc. And Veronque here is Boardman, uh, Bartoli, together with... Um, oh, who else we got there? Yonkers, Sorensen, Kierpucci. So whilst we're concentrating on the yellow on the yellow jersey here. Who is still with him? Alano is still with him. And rocketing up comes the young rider from Telecom to help the pace. Ludenberg are in there too. Berzin is still there, and Inrain is still there too. Escartin. Reese is doing just the right thing. He's showing his supreme strength. But where is Romiga? I'm trying to appear down there to see what's happened to Romiga. I 
I can't see Tony Rominger, who's been suffering with that uh, bad knee. One kilometre to go to the top of the climb. So, we just heard that Rominger has lost something like about uh, 150 metres on that group. So, Rominger is suffering with his knee as over the top of the climb goes our leader at the moment. So, bad day for Tony Rominger. Losing ground, he started the day in third spot, 53 seconds down on uh, Bjorn Rees. Veronk, seventh at 3 minutes and 39 seconds, is here with LeBlanc. Now, will these two of them settle their differences and ride together? A, to help LeBlanc get the stage victory, B, to put Veronk in with a shout for the yellow jersey. Rain. One, two, three, four, back to the front. Berzin following, then in the yellow jersey. It's Bjorn Rees. <laughs> French crowd going absolutely mad here. As over the top of the second category climb, uh, Santanez Anatez goes. Blanc and Leblanc, one minute 36 seconds down and there's the main group with Luttenberger in there Alano, Berzin and Bjorn Rees Miguel in the rain also in that group and Ulrich looking down that group of the men who are in the top position about I can't see the Roslato rider Ugramov who lying length over on general classification he's taking a bit of a pacing today together with Romigo who's got that bad knee he's been drifted off the back I'm trying on my uh, headphones here to pick up from the uh, from the race the situation on the road because I had thought at one time that uh, the Melbourne group was still between the, the leader and this little pack here, but somehow I must have missed a blink uh, down there when they were concentrating upon the uh, upon the main pack uh, because uh, in fact here we are they're still there and they've been, they've not been giving us information. I'll just try and listen again on this one, but. Um, Salvadelli went over the top in first place, definitely, and they've been concentrating on, on Veronk and LeBlanc. And this is still the um, Rodriguez then, together with Sorensen. I haven't seen Borman and Kipuchi and the rest getting caught at all by this little group here. So it's a bit chaotic out there. They've all been concentrating quite rightly on the battle for the yellow jersey and the, the stage victory still at stake because it was a six-minute lead at the bottom of that uh, short, sharp climb. And I didn't think somehow that... Oh, 
about five and a bit minutes, I suppose, that Bourbon and Kipuchi and people like uh, uh, Bartoli and Sorensen et al. would get caught by the group that quickly, so they must still be there. Here we are then. They keep talking about those riders being in the lead, but they're not. This is the leading group here. Salvadelli, Rodriguez and Sorensen, and wedged in between this lot and Veronk and uh, Leblanc is certainly, uh, for my money anyway, the uh, one or two remnants of that break when it could be that we've got Borman in there as well, but uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed. Garini is also somewhere about the place too. Another of the... Yep, they're going to pick up another of those escapers. This looks like Cat Eye now, they're sweeping up one by one. We saw Thibaut being swept up. You see, the trouble is when we're commentating here, I, I've got the uh, information coming out of my headphone in French, and there are two men speaking at the same time. We also have the producer talking to about going to queue breaks and to, uh, uh, and to ad breaks and so on. So it gets quite exciting here. LeBlanc and Garini, these are the two which, which we know are here. Um, Garini was in that leading group uh, with Boardman, Chiapucci, Salvadelli, uh, Sorensen, Yonkers, and Rodriguez or so. So he's dropped back now, Garini. And that means two Palti riders here to chase down the group, which last time we don't wear. I've got probably somewhere out there, Bourbon somewhere out there, but of course, when they flip the camera backwards and forwards, if they're not bothered about blokes getting caught and shot up the back, then we've, we've just got to wait and hope that it gets picked up and flashed through to you, because I know you're interested to see where Bourbon's got to, and so am I. So about a couple of minutes back to this group at the moment containing the yellow jersey. They have certainly cut back that um, that time, which at one time was nearly up to six minutes, but still the only man that's really lost out today so far from the riders in the top of the general classification is Romiga, who's been shelled out with his bad knee and fight to try and get back. I'm looking in there to see. I've heard no news of him coming up for back into the main pack. Ulrich is number 28, see the fellow with the, uh, his elbows bandaged up, well that's the best young rider on general classification, riding for telecom team, he's in fifth spot. Just 13 riders there on this, the 13th of July, on stage 13. Count again, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13. Yes, and unlucky for Rominga, uh, he's been shelled out with the trouble with his knee. And Rominga this morning in third spot, 53 seconds down, uh, and tipped as a likely contender for the yellow jersey. But, of course, banging down on his knee a couple of times hasn't done him any good at all. So this little group, we've just about got anybody who's anybody. That's Escartin in the green shorts, and now we're going back up to leaders. Salvadelli, who led over the top of the climb, is still towing up uh, Sorensen. There we are. I told you, Steve, that Bolman was still there. Bolman is still there. Hamburger is still there. Karaki Pucci is there. Then with the flowing locks, it's uh, um, Brochard. They've got Taffy still there. So we're going back to this little group here. Well, we are jumping back and forth today, aren't we? There's a Palti bus on the right-hand side. These are big team buses that the various riders use to go to and from the stages. Um, and after stage finish, to go back to hotels and so on. Oh, oh, what's the problem over there? Oh, it's Garini. I think he's had enough. Has he got a problem? Yeah, there, the Gantine car. Been up to speak to Boardman. And Garini has had enough now. Well, he was in that breakaway group that's been out there for something like about, uh, what? Nearly 100 kilometres. In fact, I think that is Romiga that's got back. Yes, on the right-hand side, just in front of the green shorts, it looks like Romiga has got back to uh, the yellow jersey. One minute back to this group. 
about another minute back to the yellow jersey group and it looks like Romaga has got back so not unlucky 13 as far as he's concerned what a race we got today for the finish today so the next time the coat to fall that uh, little quick turn then through Bessie Bessie on Chandos and the Auvergne oh what a sight two great climbers here the man on the left hand side of the screen ex-world champion Leblanc on his way back in no uncertain style what is left of the main peloton here includes most of the men in the uh, fight for the yellow jersey there the yellow jersey just followed by Indurain and then Dufo in the Fessina colours that's Romiga who's recovered and got back and he's got behind him in the rainbow jersey Olano uh, Fernandez Jean just getting dropped off the front of this little lot the Mape rider going well the pale blue chap with the blue shorts that's Burton they're starting to wind it up now and one or two riders are beginning to struggle the hammer's going down and it looks like Luttenberg are looking over his shoulder it's doing the damage the little specialist climber is really now blowing this race apart at the seams Luttenberger looks back the man who's lying on sixth place on general classification two minutes and 38 seconds down has now started to put the pressure on and it looks as if the rest of the riders are strung out behind him hanging on for grim death and it's a yellow jersey that sat on his wheel then Indurain then Dufo then Olano then Berzin and I think that Romiga's had another bad uh, turn and he's dropped off the front uh, dropped off this front pack here so Luttenberger on the coat to fall then uh, Reese, then Indurain then Dufo then Olano then Berzin and the rider from the refing team I'll have to have a quick check down there because he hasn't been in the frame very much in the past but he's certainly climbing very well indeed right now and staying with that group that uh, are chasing after these two riders on the road now they're beginning to get back up here to the Boardman group I'd like to use that. I know that Tadek puts it in there, and he's the senior man of, of that little party, I suppose. But uh, Borman looks like he's going to get company now. And here they come. Abdul Jaffrov still hanging on the back there. Well, he tried to win the stage today, but once they got to mountains, he took a bit of pace. He, now he's hanging on in there. And these are our leaders. Salvadelli takes him over the line in first place. Borman there in the Gan colours with the whitish coloured crash hat on them. And straight through now, they see that they've got the old one-two here. Fessin have got two men here, Brochard and Veronk. LeBlanc works his way through. Chris Borman quite rightly recognises that the fast men are coming through and he better get on the wheel quickly. The service cars are going away as the devil starts to run up alongside them. And the devil has had done his damage today because Romiga has been blown out again. Luttenberger on the front, then uh, in the yellow jersey, Bjorn Rees, then Indre. They now can see what has been the break of the day in front of them. I mean, just come to that lovely little place, uh, Bessie. It's an amazing little town, by the way. Pickley didn't have time to look at it with the race going on. So, so interesting because they now go up towards the top of this climb of the Côte de Fou. They've just got to, what, 5.5 kilometres to go to the finish of the race. He goes down there, the little town of Bessie. Do you know what they've got, in fact? The, the houses in the, in the old town, they have connecting doors in some cases to allow the townspeople to go through their neighbours' homes so they go to church in winter without having to go out in the, in the cold air because it's very snowy in this part of the world. And they've got a lovely ski museum uh, uh, ahead of them in Super Bessie. It's this great skiing part of the world. But they're all going up now, they're not going down. But the man who's gone down the GC, if he doesn't get back up into this group, is Tony Romiga with the bad knee, blasted out yet again. There's your sign, five to go. And Festina really are here in great numbers. Brochard, Dufo, um, Bruronk, they've got a lot of men up here today. Dufo's in the chasing group, that's Brochard there with Bruronk. There's Chris Borman, Hamburger, there Taffy, then Leblanc. 
Kim Pochi and Abdul Jafarov. What a gathering, and great to see Chris with that lot, isn't it? Superb. Five kilometres to go. Chris Borman is in with a shout of a stage victory. Well, certainly finishing if he, this lot keeps away in the, uh, well, the top eight or ten on the stage. If they can catch these three back. I think on the impetus of Veronk and LeBlanc, they should catch these lot back. Certainly Veronk has got uh, Rochard with him. Yep, here we are, they're sending everything forward. Salvadoli looks back, Solensen had tried so hard again to get a stage victory. He nearly made it the other day, they swallowed him up going into the finish. Four to go. Is LeBlanc going to wait then, because just two kilometres from the finish, we got the uh, Monte de Superbest. In fact, it's but two, the actual climb itself, the last one today, is 1.6 kilometres, so they're just about starting this one. You can see there, that's it. That's the long climb up towards the top. That's the last one of the day to the Monte de Superbest. And then off the top of that, they've just got two kilometres to go into the finish. Well, we've had a couple of flattish days in racing. We had, like, uh, five, six men go away the other day. We had a group go away yesterday, and not much happened from the main pack. But today, with the mountains being at the back end of the race, it really has done a lot of damage, and I think it's done a lot of damage to the hopes of Romiga of getting that yellow jersey. Reese has been so powerful and so strong. His teams look so good all the way through. And there he's on the front now with the Indrain behind, who really wanted to pull back the odd half minute or so today, but it hasn't worked out in his favour. Under this sort of pressure, they may well catch the leaders. Laurent stretching them, LeBlanc on his wheel. And LeBlanc nips past again, there's Borman just down the road, can't hold these two mountain specialists, so they go towards the top for more points at Kingdom Mountain's competition. LeBlanc roaring away now, is he just going for points in the competition, or is he going to try and win the stage? LeBlanc is after him now. You can sense the atmosphere. And they pull in Yonker, we haven't seen much of him for some time now. Enthusiasm of the French, looking for yet another stage victory. They reel in Bartoli, three kilometres to go. It's a gentle rise, the last thousand metres are still going up. And there's Union Jack, just sort of side of the road. That'll give Chris some encouragement, but he's not a specialist climber like these people are. But once they get over the top of this one, they've got a thousand metres running down and a thousand metres of very gradual climb. Abdul Jafarov's day is a number. There he goes. He's been caught. So Taff is being caught by Luttenberger on the front. These specialist climbers are on their home territory. This is the territory they love. It's a gift to be able to climb like this. And LeBlanc has come back with a bang. Already stage victor in the Tour this year. He had one victory about six weeks ago. Kierputsch is being pulled back now by his teammate uh, Luttenberger. Well, Claudio has tried manfully today. He's a little gutsy character, but right now he just doesn't have the punch in his legs. But the career team managed to find climbers all the way through. And they've got Luttenberger now leading the chase with LeBlanc, now he's going to catch up with Salvadelli. What a finish we're having today. So, looks like Berzin has been dropped as well out of the yellow jersey group as now away goes LeBlanc. He's caught Salvadelli and Barong is trying to get up to him. LeBlanc had crashed on the second day of the race, laid out unconscious. He had another crash, and he reckoned that he lost about, about five or six minutes in those crashes and would have been way up in the general classification. There you can see the King of the Mountains award ahead of him. He's going to go over in third place because still we've got a lot of the degrees on the frontier. Sorensen just behind him. But look at the speed this man's coming. He's got him in sight now. Just two kilometres to go, and he's come and closed the gap down. Riding out of his skull, the man who, having got the rainbow jersey around his shoulders, signed for Le Groupement, a company which had a lot of adverse publicity on the press and in TV for their selling methods. The company then decided to cut the links with the racing team because they couldn't support it, so last year he lost his sponsor, as did Robert Miller, 
And there we can see Chris Boardman just about to be overtaken by the yellow jersey, who has got rid of Berzin, certainly, but Indrain is on his will. Dufo is still there. Luttenberger is still there. So is Alano. Boardman's now been overtaken by the yellow jersey. Bartoli's likewise been done, too. What a ride here from Rees, who's just burying himself to make everybody know that he's still the boss. And they've come back together again now. This is the main group. As Sorensen looks back, they'll be contesting the sprint finish in just about a couple of kilometres' time. Polka dot jersey of Veronk uh, on the front, just ahead of LeBlanc on the... Uh, General classification for the, the King of the Mountains. Veronk is leading 196 points ahead of this man, Reese with 115 points. Romig 107. LeBlanc fourth at 95 points as again the pressure's being put on by the yellow jersey. So LeBlanc certainly, with one kilometre to go, has improved his position on the King of the Mountains. And now Veronk say, Come on, you luck, come through. Now you see Veronk may be able to climb. So can LeBlanc, but they've got Sorensen in there who's got a great big turn of speed. Here we've got to Chris Borman in this little group. He's managed to survive and get back in again, but uh, he's not in with a shout for that stage victory which he was looking for today, but he's ridden very strong indeed today, and he's with the yellow jersey now, but this is the group that's going to fight it out for the finish. LeBlanc is sitting on the wheel of Veronk. Sorensen in third spot. Rodriguez in fourth. They can't hang about because Reese will be tying him up here. Reese is punching gaps between himself and Berzin and Romiga, who seem to have lost uh, at the, the group. Well, he comes back, Salvadelli catches them and nothing, and they didn't expect that. Salvadelli came steaming back at them. Inside, 400 metres to go, Salvadelli caught them napping. Who's going to get this one? LeBlanc has already had a stage victory at Les Arcs, but that's a long grind up the finish. It flattens out here now, and the strongest man undoubtedly in the sprint, to my money, is Sorensen. He's been doing a lot of work on it on the front on his own. The Rabobank rider now in the orange and white swings around that corner. The sharp right, sharp left. It's a very tricky finish, this one indeed. Sorensen, has he got the power to get away? Rodriguez is on his wheel, swinging around again, right against the banking. Has Sorensen got round in one piece? He has. Rob comes out the saddle, but Sorensen puts his head down, then puts his arm in the air, takes the victory ahead of Rodriguez. Rob is third. LeBlanc is fourth and Salvadori in fifth place but look at this the way which uh, Reese swings around the corner in the yellow jersey he's not looking to get anybody to take a second away and Borman comes out of the saddle and starts to go around here one of the best placings Borman's had apart from the prologue time trial Chris has ridden himself really into the standings again today showing guts and determination just finishing there alongside uh, Indurain ahead of Dufo ahead of the yellow jersey, but the yellow jersey had done the damage now because a lot of riders who were trying to tackle that uh, yellow jersey have been shelled out down at the back of this road. And here comes uh, Rominger, he's lost time today. Also, it looks like I think Ulrich is coming in. Ulrich's lost time as well. The gap back from the yellow jersey to Ulrich coming in now on my watch then was some 20 odd seconds, 22. Rominger there, 22 as well. And looks like Luttenberger. Where was he? I think that's him down there. And Berzin. So Berzin and uh, Rominger look like they've lost about 20 seconds, maybe 20, 25 seconds on the yellow jersey. The strength, the determination of, Berz, of, uh, of Reese to make Berzin and Rominger suffer. And here, Fernando Gines coming up for the MAPE team. The, the team contest is also wide open at the moment. MAPE want the team. They're, the moment started today in second spot, two minutes, 13 seconds down on Rabobank. Well, Rabobank, only one rider's come in so far, that was Sorensen. So I think that Mappe are going to uh, fight with the uh, 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 Telecom team for the victory today. Telecom and Mappe finishing with three riders up in that uh, front group we've seen today. So really, the team competition could go between those. And here's Abdul Jafrock. Yep, I'm clapping. I think he's done a great ride today. That's tremendous for a man who is a specialist sprinter to survive the course. He looks still very cool and calm, doesn't he? But a great ride from Abdul Jafarov. And I wonder if, in fact, uh, the Coeur de Leon prize for the most competitive rider of the day might go to Abdul Jafarov. I think he's deserved it. Another rider who fell on the first uh, couple of stages of the race. Rode himself back into form, got rid of the headache, which was with him for several days. And he's shown now 
but he's prepared to have a go even in the mountains and Abdul Jafarov finished a very tired man as we look back then at the slow motion which took Solensen to the first stage victory uh, of his uh, of this year's Tour for Sons. He's won one before, that's the second one that Rabobanka has got, because they already got one with Bogart. They really also have shown their sponsor now some success, but look how they did it. Every one of them reaching down for the very last ounce of effort, and Sorensen was the strongest. Well, this rider was also away. Guarini with the leading group for a long time. As many of the rest of them come in here trying to keep back their deficit. <laughs> the man who, in 1991, wore the yellow jersey for five days in the Tour, and then had a fall in Valenciennes when he cracked his collarbone, and that put him out of the race. He's won the Paris Tour, Les Bastolliers, Paris Brussels, and now today he's got another stage in the Tour de France to add to his uh, list of victories. And still the rallies coming in. The 145 who started today's stage. We've lost a couple of retirements on the way through. Some very tired legs in this race. Stage 13 proved also to be unfortunate and unlucky for Berzin and Romaga, who both lost about 25 seconds on the yellow jersey. Romaga, of course, suffering with a very bad knee. Burson just couldn't hold the pace, but this is the man who romped home again. Stage victor in the Tour of Italy. Now, another one to add to his success. John Rees has done a wonderful job today, but I think he'll thank his telecom team for the work they did to keep the race going at a good speed right the way through, but then Bonesto put the pressure on them and lots of the telecom boys were blasted out. But Reese showed his sheer strength to come through. He attacked and attacked and rode hard and he shelled out to Berzin and Romiga. Only Alano, Ulrich, I think Ulrich dropped a bit of time too, uh, could stay with him. Indrain also stayed with him, Escartin and one of his other riders, but nevertheless this man showed he's so strong at the moment. We thought today with the climbs at the back end there'd be an attack on Bjorn Rees of Denmark. who has been drafted in the telecom team to provide some firepower in the Tour de France. He's shown yet again the determination to keep that yellow jersey on his shoulders. Indrain just over the right-hand side there has really got a fight on his hand and he's going to take that one by the time we get to Paris in a week's time. Well, I hope you join us tomorrow at 5 o'clock. It's going to be a bit later uh, when we cover the Tour de France because, of course, it's the, uh, the Grand Prix at Silverstone back there in England. And I think England also can be satisfied today, or Great Britain can, with the way in which uh, Chris Borman rode. He came in with the group, including Indrain and the yellow jersey, after being away in that break. But this man here in the polka dot jersey has shown he's got that gift when it comes to climbing. He's got to keep it on his shoulders now. Then Rafael Gemignani on the left-hand side is shaking hands with him. A very great Frenchman many years ago. And nicely, Ralph, uh, around the scene still. So many of the old champions come to the Tour to shake hands with today's victors. And so, yet again, a polka dot jersey. I don't know how many he's got of these, by the way. He could open a shop, I suppose, with the number of polka dot jerseys that he's uh, collected over the years. Well, he'll keep that on his shoulder. I think tomorrow we're going from uh, Silverwest to, to Tull. And if I look at the, the route tomorrow, as he gets the awards from people, he's got a second category climb in the first 21 kilometres, a fourth category after 43 kilometres, a fourth category after 80 kilometres, another fourth 133, and they go up to a little climb at the end tomorrow, a third cat climb, 186 uh, uh, kilometres in all the race tomorrow, so some few short, sharp climbs tomorrow, and after a very tough day in the saddle today, and this man here happy with his stage success. I'm sure we're in for another interesting day's racing, and I hope that you'll be able to join us after the, the Grand Prix for more cycling. Or well, if you watch the Grand Prix, stay and watch the lads on the bike. So they're really giving some great entertainment. We had a couple of days when it probably wasn't that fierce to be, be, be right, but um, we had some, uh, some stuff today, and particularly short uh, right-handed bends. They 
were faced with a very difficult finish. But Sorensen knew what he had to do. And he grabbed that one. Let's look at the classification. There we are. I said that Burzin had lost time today and Rominger. Ulrich also. So only Reese could stay close to Alano. And uh, sorry, only Alano and Reese could stay in that leading group at the moment. Indrain back there, 438. He's still the same back on uh, on Reese. Skartin, it's still about the same too. But all the others, Burzin, Rominger, Ulrich, Luttenberger, all lost a bit of time. But look at Verong. He's jumped up in the seventh spot there. Uh, sorry, he's still in seventh spot, but he's closed the gap on Reese. So we've got some interesting racing yet again tomorrow. Looking at the slow motion replay with a look on the man's face, he'd been on his own for something like about 100 kilometres or in the leading group and he got the stage success that he so justly deserved. Rolf Sorensen, the victor today. So for myself, David Duffield, glad to have you with us. Uh, hope you'll join Eurosport for cycling tomorrow.